Good afternoon and thanks for visiting. My name is Cleston Oliveira. I'm a technical architect and I'll talk to you today about urban life in a slightly different perspective. This is the world that we live in. Eight billion of us living on the earth. And one very interesting happened in 2008. In 2008, human living style has broken even where half of us humans came live in cities and the other half still living in urban settings. So basically, that's it. Half of us mankind stuck in traffic. So next time you're in a traffic jam, think that half of mankind is there with you. It might make you feel better or not. But the net net of it is that 74% of us in the developed world live in cities. And 44% of us in the developing world also live in cities that are growing even faster. Right? Now, talking about cities, the world has about 440 of them with more than 1 million inhabitants, and about 19 of them with more than 10 million. And those numbers are growing. We are growing, right? We're growing in numbers. Our lives are becoming more fluid, and still, infrastructure is static, is rigid, and it's limited in its capacity. It's limited in the speed at which we can grow it further. It's not elastic, and it's not responsive. So on that note, infrastructure is really not in tune with how life in the 21st century go, right? Now, beyond the infrastructure, uh, living in urban settings is mostly about going from A to B. That's our number one nuisance, right? And then getting beyond B. It's usually composing a bigger headache. If we're going to bring that closer to home, on top of the people that travel with public transport, the 8 billion of us humans drive a fleet of 1 billion cars around the planet today, according to Wards. Right? Here in the US, the car density is pretty high. There is 1.3 person per vehicle in this country. That's a slightly different in China, where I still have about 6.75 people per vehicle. Now, to put that into perspective, was China to ever have the car density that the US has? China alone would have one billion vehicles roaming around. Think of the kind of desperation that that would cause in traffic. Now that the scare has happened, what I'm here to talk to you about is the fact that we need a better user experience in urban living. Now. Looking at the world that we live in and the nuisances of the cities, I don't want to just complain about that generically. Let's do it in a more structured way. So we're talking about getting from A to B, right? So we're translating that into urban logistics. What are the problems there? Problem one, the getting from A to B with public transport, you're basically stopping at regular schedules in regular stops, even if nobody's getting in or getting out. Right? Uh, traffic blends in with public transport. They get on one another's way. And these things, they are working on their own clock. And they don't necessarily respond to what we are doing, where we are coming from, where we are going at that point in time. The other thing that's also a nuisance is we live in cities that offers a thousand things to do. But when can we actually come around to do them? Right. It seems that the restaurant that you want to dine tonight is always fully booked. Yet, numbers show that restaurants often don't operate at capacity and that they waste a preposterous amount of food. That's not sustainable, especially at the pace at which we are growing and migrating into cities. Beyond that, was that not vaccine enough? There's the administrative burden of living in a city. It's not as if you've got all the freedom in the world to do whatever you like, to park where you like, to have the car that you want, whatever day you want, right? We buy and sell each other houses, we change cars, we move house, and we have to broadcast that new address. We need to get insurances and change insurances. We need to get permits, we have to pay for them, we have to apply for them, we have to renew them. And if we don't, we get a fine. On the other hand of the spectrum, if we're stuck in traffic, the municipality doesn't compensate you for the time that you lost. There isn't a symmetry in that relationship that maybe is only coincidental, but it is there. 
Now, the only way that with a population that grows at this pace and migrates into cities at this pace, that we can make urban life palatable is by having cities embrace the age of all things smart. So if we're going to talk about all things smart, smart is made of three layers, right? Smart is made of sensors at the base layer. Sensors are to infrastructure what wearables are to us humans, right? So they are deterministic and they enhance a sense that we already have. For instance, we know we have a, a pulse. We are alive after all. But we don't know the rate, we don't know what makes it go up, when it goes up, when it goes down, what are the factors surrounding it. But if you have a wearable on, the wearable is actually going to capture that information and make you aware of it. Right? The same goes for the city. Sensors will take advantage of the fact that the infrastructure watches live from a privileged position and it will detect what's going on, the motions of the city, and it will turn that into electrical pulses that then get fed into the second layer of smart, which is controllers. So controllers are this piece that's responsible for capturing those pulses and turn it into a stream of data, right? So that is basically a parking sensor that is saying bzz, 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 becoming car there, car there, car there, car not there, right? And that is the stream of information that is then moving into the cloud. The cloud is getting these streams of data from all things that are happening into the city, and they are treating it as a digital representation of every single thing that happens within that city. Right? Now, once that information is in the cloud, we can turn that into meaningful aggregates and actionable information. And with that, we can make that infrastructure that was otherwise rigid and non-responsive react to the facts on the ground. Now, in order to illustrate that, we have decided to tackle the problem in a small scale, and we've put together a Lego-sized city that's residing right here at the IoT cabin, and I would invite you all to come and visit. I'd be happy to show you the fully-fledged demo in there. And how did you go about that? So, we built some urban settings, a couple of train stations, one street, some parking, right? We got some people in there, a bunch of cars. And we fit it all with sensors. So anything you ever do in smart town, the sensors are capturing it and passing it on to a MyRio controller, courtesy of our customer and partner, National Instruments, with whom we have partnered to make smart town actually smart. Now, MyRio, in turn, streams that information as a flow of data onto the Salesforce cloud, namely the IoT cloud. And the IoT cloud, in turn, takes that digital representation of what's going on and makes the city reactive and responsive to what's going on on the ground. So right now, I'm going to say a blessing for the angels of the internet, hope for the best, and call my colleague that's not exactly on top of that building, but who's going to live stream this demonstration from the IoT cabin for us. It doesn't look like the angels of the internet are with us today and showing something about the internet of things without the internet, the things feel a little bit lost. So I will invite you to join us at the IoT cabin right after the presentation to see the fully fledged demo. Um, in a sense, once all things are connected in a smart city and you have all of your public parking, your private parking, uh, digitally exposed so that it can be consumed by different applications, it will take your navigation and uh, route planning to a whole new level. And it will make a lot of other things much easier as well. So if we're going to break down the benefits here, essentially the taxpayer is going to benefit from a city that actually responds to them, right? So one of the things that we'll be showing you in the demo today, and we'll hopefully show you in the demo when you come visit us, is every time that uh, our parking lot, which constitutes of three spots, is full, the traffic light in the beginning of the street will stay red twice as long to prevent more cars from coming and driving around frustrated looking for parking. Right? Once the parking gets empty, we close the parking, I'm sorry, the traffic light at the other end of the street to prevent those cars from, say, jamming the beltway, for instance. And on the business front, 
We have a digital representation of everything that goes on on the rail, whether the train arrives, departs on time, lingers on the station. And based on those intervals and those changes in state from normal service to delayed service, we can actually broadcast that to the private sector surrounding that station. And the private sector surrounding that station can then offer flash promotions for the people that are there. So what this is actually doing is turning every citizen and every visitor of the city uh, a potential customer. So the city itself is a channel for business in that sense, in the best sense of the digital sense. Now, the other thing to it is for the city planner. Now, here we have this data not just being captured, but this data is also being amalgamated into meaningful and actionable aggregates. That information can be used to guide the decisions in the city planning on, for instance, how long is one supposed to be parked on a given parking spot, right? What drives more revenue and more fluidity into the city? This, these are decisions that they can take in, in a substantiated form based on the data that the city is producing about itself through its sensors, controllers, out into the Salesforce cloud. The next um, demography of users that benefit from it is the city management. Because now they have a city that can actually react to what's going in there, right? They could imagine in our scenario, we have just two train stations. Imagine when you have hundreds of thousands of train stations and trains, they cascade from one to the other. So by knowing exactly what's going on and ahead of time, you can preempt a trade and you can create uh, artificial delays that will actually preempt even bigger delays. That looks pretty good on a Lego and it's pretty funky and it only took a couple of weeks to put together. Now doing that on a real life scale, that's a much taller order, right? Now, if you think that every single street lamp and every single uh, traffic light would be connected to one or more controllers around the city of San Francisco, we're looking at a pretty, pretty large amount of data that's being produced. So with two stations, five cars, three parking spots, and one train service, Smart Town produces about 200 kilobytes per minute if we're not intervening. Right. If we extrapolate that into a city of real dimensions, the amount of data that we're producing on those data streams is pretty preposterous, right? And knowing that the sensors are actually in, in sync, that they, they report information that is reliable, and that those connections are secured, and those streams are verified, and they are dealt with, you will need a platform that has the elasticity and a history of being trusted at Salesforce.com. Ultimately, when you have that connected city, urban logistics become more flexible simp for the simple fact that if we're all route planning on a city-specific app and no one is going in or out on a given station, why even stop there? Why not skip that? and through a shortcut and get everybody around a lot faster. Save on fuel, save on time, increase sustainability, and decrease the journey from A to B. I know that a question that kept coming when I was bringing this up on the demonstration today is that, well, people running to the train station or running to the bus stop, they may or may not have the time to route plan or to buy a ticket. Now, that would be valid in the 90s when you actually had to go somewhere. Today, there is an app for it. And we're not talking an app of five years ago where you needed to do 12 clicks to buy a ticket or to reserve a seat. We're talking about a high UX experience of today's app where you're going to do that with two clicks, right? Looking at the administrative burden problem, this is the 21st century. We shouldn't have to go somewhere to apply for a permit and to renew the permit and to pay for the permit. We should be able to do that with an app. Visibility and access is actually the highest takeaway from this, and it's the area where the combination of sensors, 
controllers and the cloud can make the highest impact. Right there, if you have all of your, all of your services and your capacity advertised, right? So we are in the age of all things Uber and all things Doodle. If all the restaurants in a city advertise their availability, much as all the parking spots, private and public, in cities like Tel Aviv and Vienna are actually digitally available to be consumed, that can be a part of the decision making on your route planning. Moreover, if you can pay automatically based on your geolocation on an app that securely holds the credit card that you want to make that payment with, right? You can drive in and out of a park, drive on a spot and out of a spot, and simply be reminded of how much you have paid so far and how much longer you're entitled to stay there. That's going to preempt that fine from happening, and that's going to optimize the utilization of that space. That is part of what I call a better urban user experience. Ultimately, that's the world we got. That's the world that we live in. And that's how we're all together going to get into a better user experience. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope to see you at our demo spot.